I recognize it's only been two minutes uh, after the hour, but uh, to ensure we can maximize the time for our fabulous panel to discuss the social emotional health and well-being for Chicago's youth, I'm going to kick it off now. Again, my name is Mia Harris and I work for the Office of Community Education Partnerships at Northwestern University. Uh, like many organizations, the OSEP team supports the My Shy, My Future initiative uh, to bring together and host conversations like the one you're joining today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our fabulous panel facilitator, Chief Jen, to lead us to the conversation. Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Jen Farrell Rotman. I'm the proud chief of Network 3 Chicago Public Schools. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I serve the Austin and Belmont Cragen neighborhoods. Our conversation, this discussion, will delve into how organizations and schools have supported the -emotional, social emotional health and address trauma for youth prior to remote learning. Now, how have organizations changed their strategies in response to the pandemic and current events? And how can in-school and out-of-school stakeholders work together to continue supporting the well-being of Chicago's youth moving forward? Our agenda today is first, we're gonna meet our amazing panel. Then we're gonna have a connected conversation. There will be an opportunity for Q&A and a closing. So I am grateful be, to be in this space with you to discuss how we can support our youth this year. Now is the most important time to engage in this conversation. More than ever, we as community partners and educators need to come together as an ecosystem of support for our youth through the implementation of trauma-informed and responsive practices while proactively supporting the social and emotional needs of our students. We need to create a scaffold of opportunities to build positive supporting adult relationships with our young people. Today, I'm excited to virtually sit among my colleagues here. We encourage you to ask questions through the chat. We will get to many as time allows, but please understand we may use some of them for future conversations. We're gonna get started. I would like to introduce you to the amazing panelists, and we're going to be answering the following question. Panelists, you're gonna answer, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role. How have your experiences working with youth shaped your views on the importance of intentionally addressing the social emotional needs of our young people? I'd like to first introduce our panelist, April Lilstrom. She's um, from Urban Initiatives. Hi everybody, um, my name is April Lilstrom. I'm a program director at Urban Initiatives and we work with 50 or so schools around the city focusing on using sport and play-based youth development to help young people in specifically underserved communities achieve in the classroom uh, as well as build resiliency and social skills. I'm really happy to be there and I here, here and um, feel like that's kind of my angle at approaching this is thinking about how to um, advocate for the power of sport and play in terms of a holistic school experience. Thank you, April. Now I would like to introduce Eric Reyes from U Media at the Chicago Public Library. Hello everyone, um, I'm Eric Reyes. I'm an admin in the teen services department of the Chicago Public Library. Um, my role is to support library staff across the city in creating programs based on teen interest um, in hopes that teens form a lifelong partnership with the library. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Helen Antonopoulos from CPS, the Director of Social Emotional Learning. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everyone. Again, Helen Antonopoulos with the Office of Social Emotional Learning. Uh, my experience comes really from my heart as a social worker for nearly actually more than 20 years. Um, I give my age away there. But the work as a social worker is very much connected to the work that the Office of Social Emotional Learning does, which is creating those safe and supportive spaces for students, but also for staff and adults that support students. Um, so we know that trauma is one of those reasons, and it's a lot of the work that I've done in my career, and I'm really glad to be able to continue that work um, here at CPS. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Maurice Sweeney, the Chief Equity Officer at CPS. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna say great to see you as if we were in a room hanging out <laughs> conversation. Um, essentially, my role in CPS um, is to look at policies, practices, procedures, talk about mindsets and relationships and resources and all the things that drive opportunity for young people, especially those historically underserved. So 
looking forward to learning and sharing space with these great uh, people on this call. Thank you. And now Charles Anderson, the principal of Michelle Clark High School. Good morning, everyone. Once again, Charles Anderson. I am so happy to be here. I'm the principal of Michelle Clark, uh, located in the Austin community. And uh, working with youth uh, have shaped, it's been a shape for me because I'm able to now know they need a huge voice in talking about their traumas and understanding. Um, and that they need someone to support them as they go through some of the things that many of us have never been through and how do we help them through those things. Thank you. Now, Renee Green, the Executive Director of Mikva Challenge. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, again, Renee Green, Executive Director at Mikva. Um, our vision at Mikva is that um, the this world just is a stronger, inclusive um, world, but particularly democracy, valuing youth voice. And we do that. We have youth-facing programs as well as teacher-facing programs, but all focused on amplifying the voices of young people and empowering them to uh, take a role um, in uh, their futures and really uh, amplify the voices that they have. The lens that I bring, I am a former CPS teacher um, and in my classroom, youth voice was very important. I saw myself much more as a facilitator um, than a teacher and then moved to the uh, school counselor space. So I also bring that um, really in, in, at, in that role, both in the classroom um, and in my role as a youth counselor, um, social emotional needs were ever present. No matter what I was teaching, no matter what the young people were facing in the classroom, I had to understand them and their position and where they came from. And so I bring that um, into my work, not only um, following my time leaving the classroom, but in my work as MIPA as well as putting the student um, at the center of everything that we do and understanding their realities. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Molly Burke, the Director of Student Support and Engagement Department at CPS. She may be having some technical difficulties. Um, so um, Yes, and that technical difficulty is even after all these months, I have not figured out how to hit unmute. So <laughs> <laughs> that is it. Good morning, Molly Burke. Um, I run the Office of Student Support and Engagement, and what we do is support um, some of the most vulnerable and highly mobile students, such as our um, students in temporary living situations, students in DCFS care, our students who are exiting juvenile detention, um, and then we also work on supports and engagement, uh, such as our out of school time programming, community schools, and supporting truant students. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to begin our discussion. Um, so the first question is going to go to Molly. Molly, what role do you think trauma-informed environments in adults plays in supporting children both inside and outside of the school? Yeah, so I, it's critical for the populations of students that I have um, the honor of working with. And specifically, um, they're the students who are coming back in who experience extreme trauma, providing them with a consistent environment that they may not be getting outside, um, along with the caring adults. What we hear from students when we survey them after participation is that their ability to feel like they are a connected learner and a successful learner, that they have connections with adults and with peers increases. Um, so those are all very important for the populations that we're, we work with. Thank you, and I'd like to get um, your insight, Eric. Um, okay, uh, so trauma-informed is kind of a buzzword, so I just wanted to define it in the way that I understand it. Um, and so trauma-informed means to be to have the knowledge of the impact of trauma and to prepare your environment to support people who have experienced trauma. So at the library, we're not trauma experts by any means, um, but we set up our environment to meet some immediate needs for folks like uh, bathrooms and shelter and heat and cooling. Um, so that ensures that people who have suffered trauma um, feel welcome and safe as well as everyone else, you know. Um, in our U-Media spaces, we use this uh, theory of learning called HAMAGO. Um, 
if you're not familiar, that's hang out, mess around, geek out. And that model um, allows for teens to warm up to the adults in the space at their own pace. So um, with no judgment and like very low stakes. So again, like it's essential for young people to establish like uh, trust and safety. And that leads to, you know, building relationships. And then once we got them, we do all types of fun stuff, you know? Um, so that's, you know, I feel like that's our role. Like, you know, we, we open every day during the school year at one o'clock and there's a line at the door and we're not like, we have an idea of why teens are there, but we don't judge. Um, we allow them to come in, form that relationship. And then over time we can say, hey, you know, it might be a good idea if you went back to school, you know, um, but we can't do that um, from the jump. You know, we have to develop that relationship. It's all about this relationship. Thank you. Helen, do you want to um, yeah. be in on this? Of course. And I'm so glad you mentioned the word relationships. Uh, for many years, our office um, has focused on providing trauma interventions to students. So training school social workers and counselors to do these small groups. Um, but what we've learned as we become more aware about trauma is that students have a variety of experiences and the sorts of supports they need are just as different as the traumas um, and the ways that the traumas have impacted them. So we've shifted our model and are really thinking that relationships are interventions, right? So it's not just having to pull a student out for a small group, but what are ways in which we can create connections, like Eric mentioned, with adults and with their peers that can also build resilience and support recovery and cause repair um, to students who've experienced that stress and trauma. Um, so we've shifted our model. Uh, our office is actually leading a, a collaborative initiative at the district called the Healing Centered Project um, to create a trauma framework for not just our students, but the adults around them, including the adults in the building and their adults at home, wherever that is and whoever that is, um, and across those multiple layers. So not just at that highest risk or most intense, but also just that supportive environment and that relationship with someone um, that can make such a difference to them. Thank you for that, Helen. I think um, incorporating the adults in the process is also very important in addressing their, their needs as well. Thank you. So now we're, we have a couple questions. Um, so my first question is to some of our um, CPS team members. And this is, um, in the development of a trauma responsive schools is our ultimate goal as a network and as a district. What recommendations do we have for out of school partners or community-based um, organizations to work with schools and establishing coherence across the school community and the district. And I'd like to ask this question of Maurice Sweeney. Got it. Thank you. And good morning again. Um, I, I wrote, I started to draw something the other day where I recognized some of our community partners are really actively and ongoingly made that up involved in the lives of families by providing direct supports. And there's this sort of through line that we are continuing to establish between what is the work of CPS, what are the work of supportive organizations, and how do we all draw connections with families and thinking about those families that have been historically underserved or marginalized uh, within our community. So I think one of the things that organizations can do well, and that many of them do well, is that they are involved in the life of the family in a respectful way. So like, how do we learn what the needs of families are and how do they connect families with the social services or advocating um, at schools for what the needs of those families are? I think that that can continue to happen. And then I think there's also a cross function between how are organizations, how can they come together um, to expand their bandwidth in supporting entire communities or zip codes? That's been one of my latest thoughts around um, if we're an organization that focuses on, um, you know, family advocacy, and if we're an organization that focuses, focuses on opportunity um, for parents with economic change and jobs, how do we sort of come together and work across each other's scopes of work in order to um, be more succinct and synchronize some progress for families? So that's my current thinking at the time. Thank you for that. And um, I'd like to turn it over to Molly Burke. Yeah, I'd like to build on what Chi Sweeney was talking about, those connections within the community and also between schools. Um, the populations of students that we serve are so highly mobile 
And so having that connection, if they are moving um, across the city or within the organization, that's very helpful. Um, and then the other is also the connectivity to other city agencies that they may be working with and partnering with. A lot of our students are doing involved in different systems. Um, and so having connections there is important as well for these students. Thank you. And Helen? Um, following Maurice and Molly's lead, you guys are setting me up so nicely. I'm glad I wasn't the first person. Um, for many years before I came to CPS, I worked for a nonprofit agency in schools. And so I'm, I really feel lucky that I can see both perspectives. Um, and so as Molly and Maurice have mentioned, partners are so vital to the supports of students. Um, and I think the next thing that we could do better, both of us as partners and as CPS, is to ensure that there's a continuity with the school system. And so for us, um, a thing that I would love to see more of our partners do and that we have made a commitment to support them in is bridging that gap. And so, so that our partners don't feel like guests in our building, but actually truly collaborators in caring for students. And so um, helping to maintain a continuity of care, but also coordinating that care, staying in contact with the school um, leaders and providers so that we all have that wraparound sense of how the student is doing. Um, the other thing I would recommend and would love to support our partners to do is for them to also be trauma-informed, to look at their agency practices and policies, um, ensure that they're providing trauma training and supervision for their staff, both so that they can deliver those services to students, but that they can also take care of themselves as well. Thank you. Yes, we're very much working on that in Austin. Um, and to that point, I'd like to uh, get your insight, uh, Charles. Wow. I mean, following all these, I was like, I should just sit here and smile. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that I think about from a school standpoint, when uh, we're working with partners, and one of the things we're doing definitely in the Austin community is coming up with a common language. Um, and so that everybody that is coming in and starting to work, understand what this language of trauma is and, and how are we defining it. But also recognizing the flow of, the tra of trauma and how it shows up. Um, and then how are we looking at it as a school to understand the triggers of trauma with our partners so that um, the school isn't saying one thing from their version of trauma and the partners are saying something different because of their version um, of the trauma. Um, and then the last piece I would kind of just add in with what everyone else said is making sure that we're being intentional in that support. Uh, as a partner and as a school, once again, making them feel welcome, building that relationship and making sure every kid gets that same treatment of understanding that their trauma may be individual to them, but we're all there to support that trauma as well with self-awareness um, for the adults and for the student. Thank you. And now I'd like to turn it over to our out of school time partners and community-based organizations. Um, the question we have is, what recommendations do you suggest for district partners, CPS and schools, to work with out-of-school time providers and community organizations in establishing coherence across communities and the city? And I, before I um, tap someone to answer this question, I want to remind you that the question, um, if you'd like to add a question or a comment in our, uh, in our, our Q&A, please feel free to do so at this time. And for this, I'd like to... Um, ask Eric to give insight. So yeah, this this question was a little tricky for me because like like Maurice was saying, like not all communities need the same thing and not all kids have the same SEL needs. So, um, you know, from a partner perspective, you know, I'd recommend, you know, finding the orgs that do that work really well and um, taking their lead in the community because they are the experts there, right? So like people in Austin have been doing that work for generations, you know, so there are people there who have a lot of knowledge about um, how to respond to their community. And um, when all of those community needs are met and when folks start understanding that need together, like amazing things happen, right? So. Thank you. April, what are your thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, I think um, this is, I think, connecting back to what a lot of the school folks were saying, but I think that what I would love to say to schools is to affirm that OST programs really enhance school learning. And so OST programs are not like a bonus or a reward, but should be seen as an essential component to uh, like a holistic and socially equitable school experience. Um, and then kind of what, like related to what Eric said, you know, that not all schools are going to have the same set of partners, but thinking about how like partners that are in the community where the school is can be, they're, they're the experts, they are embedded there and to, you know, think about how to coordinate with them. Um, my background is at Urban Initiatives where we are focusing on physical activity as a tool to help build social emotional skills and connecting that directly to academic success. So I'm thinking in times like prior to COVID, working with schools to think of alternatives to taking away recess as a consequence for bad behavior or something like this. Since we know that all kids, especially those who struggle in the classroom, really need to have daily active play for all sorts of reasons. Um, and then thinking about now where everything is remote, that is even more true is that we need all people in the school to be advocating for youth and parents to prioritize daily active play in addition to being in front of the screen for their Google Classroom and stuff like that, um, especially in light of all the traumatic events of this year. So as a complement to enhance academic engagement, um, young people and families need opportunities to play and be active. And that's definitely really, really challenging right now, but it's really worth it as well. Thank you for that. Now, we have a question ar around exactly what you were just speaking of. Um, currently, our youth are dealing with not only COVID-19, but the racial injustice and trauma of the tragic murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others. How are you planning to support students with, in the hybrid virtual and in-person programming? And for this, I'm gonna ask Maurice Sweeney to start. Thank you. Um, I think there are a couple of things that are coming up for me. First is um, everybody is experiencing this pandemic um, and the racial injustice and the killing of black people and anti-blackness. And what happens for young people, especially black children at this time, they're watching people argue about their safety, argue about their values, making decisions on what they need. And, and I think while we do know what trauma-informed practices are really critical, I think it's also important that we constantly engage young people in asking them what they need, how we should serve them, so that, you know, when we, when we go to restaurants, they ask us, do you have any food allergies? Um, you know, what types of food are you interested in? Are you allergic to shellfish? When we go to the doctor, they're like, tell me about where the pain is. So in the same way that people are very diagnostic in the real world, we have to be that same way with young people so that we're not just like applying blanket strategies that we believe have been effective, but really asking them what are their needs. And, and, and I think it's important to affirm young people and that, and that this is not necessarily school specific, but everybody can affirm young people when you walk past them and say good morning, um, when their essential workers in the store, you thank them for their service. And I think all of those are the small ways in which we are interacting with young people that we need to show that we value and appreciate them. Um, I know many teachers and principals are planning for the return and thinking about how to engage them. I think empathy interviews is important. I think healing circles is important. I think um, asking families to um, you know, continue to share what's happening with their young people behind the scenes is important. I think all of those are just sort of basic ways that don't require a program or a system in order to develop a segue into supporting young people. I think Helen and her team have been um, very spot on with helping schools and some schools already have behavioral health teams or care teams so that there is a system within the school to support young people to, to recognize if the student needs to see a social worker, a counselor, be connected to an outside organization. And so I think all of those Ways are important, but nothing beats the person who is interacting with the young person, ever. We have got to, and that includes me and, and all of us, constantly talk with young people, affirm their existence, let them know that they are beautiful and wonderful, and that we celebrate them for who they are, and at the same time, have strong systems in schools and being connected to outside agencies to get the long-term care that's necessary for their success. 
Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Renee, would you have anything to add to that from Mikva's point of view? Sure, um, at Mikva, we, we run out of school time programming um, after school, some on the weekends, um, and then we have a really extensive program in the summer. And our original plan when COVID first hit, well, the way our cycle runs, the schedule of our year runs, is that our programming was to end right at that time. And our youth development staff recognized right away that we could not, even though they needed a break, it was not the time to end our programming. So we actually had to shift and extend our program programming a bit because we knew um, young people just needed a space to process, but also needed um, the reassurances from the people that they would go to when they when they struggled. And so we didn't want to take that away from them, even though we needed to shift because our programming starts back up in the summer. So I would just say one thing that we had to do was just shift how our programming operated and extended. Um, we also added more frequent check-ins with youth. Sometimes it was not about the work that we were trying to promote, but it was just say, hey, what are you, how are you doing? You know, what are you up to? Um, we do have a therapist on staff. So we have a director of youth support services who um, helps to train the staff, but also has become a referral service for our staff as well. So staff were able to identify things that were happening with youth and then refer to her, many of which, as we know, as many of us have felt with COVID, this has gone on longer than we expected. Um, we're so used to the social interactions, but also real stuff was, is happening in the lives of our young people and they needed spaces to process that. So that's what we did as, as an organization. And what I've seen, even as we've had students on panels, is them using the language. So teaching them the language of self-care. I even saw someone put in a chat about, you know, going on runs. We've now hear our young people using those same terms and we've built into our sessions language around self-care and practices around self-care. Um, we also created forums for them to just process. And I remember when I was in the classroom sometimes, and I, I worked in some challenging communities, and sometimes I'd have to just stop the music and allow people the space to process either writing, what's happening. We do that as well. And actually, Chief Sweeney, I know, participated in one um, at the beginning of COVID because young people just, a lot of our work is like, what do you think we should do? And they were like, we just need a space to understand what's happening. We have questions. Um, don't look to us for answers and solutions at this point. We want quite, we want to be able to process and we want our questions. So around COVID, around George Floyd, George Floyd, around um, the protests uh, after the murder, um, we provided spaces, our council leads provided spaces for the young people just to process what was happening. And um, to me, I think that's just key to, and I, I can't remember who said it, maybe it was um, you, Principal Anderson, but just giving them that space to talk. I would also argue um, not just for young people, but also for our teachers. So we've also done that as well, is for teachers who work with us, not just around our curriculum, but really just having a space to say, how are you feeling at this moment and what does it mean? Because then they are the people who are in direct contact um, with the young people. So th those are some of the approaches that um, we have taken. We also work very closely with CPS's um, Department of Social Science and Civic Engagement. So being close to understanding, you know, what's happening at the district level, how can we engage, how can we leverage that team to support us and vice versa has been something um, that has been really critical uh, to us at this time. Giving children the opportunity to have voice and be empowered. Thank you for that. Um, our goal as a community is to build an ecosystem of support for our youth, creating equitable academics and wraparound supports. In your experience, what steps and commitments can we make as a community to support our children? I'd like to turn this question over to Eric. Um, yeah, I like this question because I think for the most part that ecosystem already exists. There's like a lot of great groups uh, especially groups serving youth that are out there and um, they're doing great work, right? Like um, we've worked with Mikva before and super impressed by their approach and have been influenced by their approach. So um, there's, uh, again, shout outs to them. Um, but we still have, you know, a lot of folks in like very desperate situations. And I think that shows, you know, how, how, um, how big this thing is that we're up against, right? This like general, generational trauma and poverty, like we 
are all pushing back on it, but it's still, it's still there. So as far as commitments, um, I'm super inspired, like others have said, like um, by how youth are kind of leading the charge at this point politically and making their voices known. Like I think some of our teens have had that time to process and now like I see them, you know, out there as activists. And um, so as a community, I think, you know, we should commit to like hearing them and really listening to them. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Verne, do you have something to add? Um, sure. I mean, even to, to Eric's point, there are multiple organizations in community. So I would say, you know, one commitment that we should be making as a community is to be more integrated, is to better understand who exists, um, who, how, who are our allies. I always say we can't do it all. And so we shouldn't try to do it all, but we should find out who our connectors are. One, one previous role I played was understanding in a school community, who are the partners there? What are the needs of the young people? How can we collaborate? We even found in my previous role that there were, we all worked with that same young person and we're trying to figure out how to address the needs of that same person and we're doing it all differently without talking to each other. So I would say, you know, one recommendation that I would make is as a, as a, um, as a community is that we share lessons learned, but also figure out where are we in the same space? You know, are four, four community orgs tapping the same student? Maybe that student needs four community orgs, but there might be three other students that we've left behind because one student took, you know, took advantage of another opportunity. So really figuring out how we integrate our supports. And it's a large city, and I know that's a really large undertaking, but I also know that under this administration, there's been a really um, concentrated effort for community groups to come together more, share resources, share information, um, so, that, so it, that we are working as a collaborative um, to support the needs of our young people. And so I would just wanna think about how we just continue to do that. And I would even say we need to do that better at Mikva. We have schools that we're working in and then realize later, oh, we're working with this teacher, but this young person. So I'm not, I'm not saying something that we're not guilty of, but we want to figure out how do we come together more so that um, we're, I'm actually glad, Principal Anderson, you're on this call because I'm going to call you afterwards <laughs> because we do, we do, um, are looking to do some supports um, in the community and want to figure out what's already there how do we know, how do we leverage those supports that are already there and how are we not stepping on each other's toes but figuring out how to collaborate better? Thank you. And I think as a former principal with many, many community partners, it was so important that we met regularly and had conversations about what we were doing with the follow-up, which is also something that um, they've created with um, Office of Student Health and, uh, or I'm sorry, with SEL. <laughs> And uh, really working with BHTs as well to provide intervention. So that's really good. We, we need to make sure that community-based organizations are sitting at the table with us regularly. Thank you. Um, now, we have had to stay at home to stay safe. How have you changed the delivery of support to ensure that we engage our youth and families, even when it's difficult to engage with them? What have you learned from these unprecedented times? Any advice? for our partners in schools across the city on how to do this work. And I'm gonna actually um, ask April to start us off with this question. I remembered to unmute myself. Um, so obviously this was a really challenging endeavor for all of us, um, especially organizations centered around sport and play. It just felt so tough for us to try and connect virtually when we had previously spent so much energy encouraging kids to minimize screen time. So it was really hard for us. Um, and so what we did was I think we checked in with our fundamentals. So, and I, I, I'm sure this will resonate with lots of people here, our programs are successful because we put time and energy into relationships with both youth and families. We strive to provide consistency, which is part of how a relationship works. Uh, and we advocate for learning through play and activity. So those fundamentals, relationships, consistency, and learning through play. And we learned way more about video editing than we thought we would. Uh, and we all became Zoom experts. Um, but I also, I heard uh, my colleague Jim Dower say this yesterday that there were several silver linings. So many of our youth, especially younger students, had, had uh, like internet connectivity issues, um, which is something that is deeply tied to racial inequity. And I just wanna say that pretty clearly. 
Um, but also a lot of our older students and parents were suddenly more accessible to us because they didn't have to travel because we were going into their, we were, you know, we were in this like, you know, virtual settings. So we were suddenly more connected with parents because they were also needed to be in the room with our middle school students on program. So middle school and high school students and parents, we felt more connected to. Uh, and we realized that with everybody at home, we needed to and could reimagine parents as coaches and play leaders. So parents need to play as well, and we can give them to tools to do that with their kids at home, and also share some knowledge around how play helps build social, emotional skills, resiliency, helps people heal, uh, and brings people together at a time when we are really struggling to figure out how to do that. Um, so that's, I guess, the advice that I would offer to schools and partners to, to revisit your fundamentals and figure out how, based on those fundamentals, you can be what young people and the families and youth you serve, what they need you to be right now. Thank you. And um, I'd like to turn it over to Charles Anderson and get your ideas. Yeah, so, you know, one of the, um, I would say great things about um, the pandemic, not that it's been really thing any great, but it's, it's pushed us to have to reimagine, uh, reconstruct, rebuild, whether we want it to or not. Um, and so one of the things that we did was we did a lot of just figuring out platforms, learning platforms. So, you know, of course we did the Google, uh, we did voice chats, we learned how to do YouTube, our videos, but then we push students to do those things. Um, the other thing that I would say is that we use students to be um, student ambassadors to each other. So if I couldn't find someone and I knew another student, they were friends in school, where do I find them? Um, and then I had staff, and I think this is part of using partners as well, is not being afraid to say, oh, they work at blah, blah, blah place. Um, I can just go get my grocery there and I can have a talk with them. Um, and so maybe switching maybe where I shopped to make sure I went to where I knew some of my students were and we did it as a staff so that we can make sure um, they were doing a good job on that. And the other thing that I would say um, as uh, for advice is right now it's open to rebuild. And so I think many of us were just afraid to, to you know, because it's just the virus, the, the, the riots, the, the, the shootings. The, and now is a time for us just to use our imaginations to just create platforms for our young people and not be afraid uh, to fail in those things. I think we are always pushing our students to imagine and to, to be the next whoever. Now is a great time to talk about what careers now have just uh, evolved from this. Um, you know, how can you use your voice in that? And I think now is the time that if I was to give um, any one advice is to just reimagine, do the world over, um, and bring everybody along with you. Thank you. Brene, do you have some thoughts? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so how we changed our delivery, of course, you know, the way that uh, everybody had to, we, we um, worked from home, but had to do some work to make sure that young people had devices. And again, partnering with schools for students who live near a school, even if it wasn't your school, to, to get a device from there. Um, students didn't always say what they had and didn't have. So I would say one thing that we learned in this time is relationships are more important than ever. And you have to do a little more digging to understand you know, what's happening in the life uh, of a young person. So I had to spend some time really saying, you know, is it that you don't have internet? You know, what it, what's happening? So we had to, to, to really drill um, down on our relationships with students in order to allow them to, to be able to participate in programming. Our programming is running this summer. There are young people now that started at 10 that will be on a Zoom until two. And we had to learn how to do that in a creative way, in a fun way, um, in a way that was not them sitting at a screen, because we don't want to sit at a screen for five hours. So the team really had to do some research on virtual learning. And there are organizations, I know DFSS and other places provided resources and tools for our team to be able to learn how to do that. But that was a big thing. It was like, we still need to be able to, we still want to make sure that we're able to achieve our goals of inserting youth voice into all of these systems. The way to do that, we still have to run our summer program. We have to do that creatively. Um, I'll also say one thing that we learned from our young people at this time was that um, participating in our program as well as participating in school was not their highest priority when the pandemic first hit and being okay with that and helping them to 
process maybe they weren't maybe they lost their part-time job or maybe their parents lost their part-time job and they had to figure that out um helping them to figure out where do i especially around the looting um young people were saying that the grocery store in their neighborhood was no longer open and they were still feeling pressure to be online and do school but they also had to figure out where their families had to eat so another piece of advice again as we're talking about the social emotional needs of our young people is that a lot of times those needs go beyond what we're trying to accomplish with them and we had to take some steps back to say how can we help you problem solve through this so that you're open to be able to participate with us in this way. And it's not just about, you know, many of them said, I'm trying to do my learning. I got my little sister, there's one device. And so helping them also to problem solve so that they could come back and engage um, was something that we had to do at this moment. And I would say are continuing to do at this moment um, more than ever. And I'll just go back again, relationships and listening, um, particularly with young people feel like not a lot of people are listening. A lot of people are telling them what to do, but not a lot of people are listening to what they think. So providing them a forum so they're, they're able to convey um, what's happening and what they're feeling so that then we can get to the other things that we, we want to do. Thank you for that. Um, and um, some thoughts are coming up for me um, just in regards to, I've been uh, kind of looking at some of the questions um, in our chat and also thinking about um, all the people that are on this call right now. And my question is open to any of the panelists. Um, there's a lot of work, great work happening across our city, and sometimes it's very much siloed on islands, meaning that we're not exactly aware of all the resources available. And that's something that we're really trying to map out and to support um, in building relationships in Austin. So my question um, for our panelists is, um, there's great work happening um, both for in the schools and with out-of-school partners, and then there's needs that the schools may have. What would be your recommendation to help build the relationship between community partners and schools and, um, and also outreach from schools to community partners to get what they need? So whoever would like to answer is welcome to jump in. Um, I'm happy to start. Uh, I mentioned that Healing Centered Project earlier, and one of the things we've done is actually host focus groups with um, some of our known community partners. And we have continuously heard that it's hard to coordinate, um, to get into the schools or to know who to call. And I saw one of the questions was, who at CPS can I contact? And I think that's what happens. And so we've made a commitment to build a partner network. A, um, and as we reopen, we're also creating guidance for partners to help facilitate um, how you can partner with schools, what communication do you need to be able to be successful, um, and then that's something that's going to hopefully um, be sustained and maintained even after we reopen. So uh, I would certainly say please reach out um, if it helps. Uh, you mentioned OST. I saw the question was for OST. So maybe Molly, you can speak to that a little bit. But for um, especially for organizations that are providing mental health or social emotional services, please reach out to me. We, um, we are designing a model to support you to be able to connect to schools and stay in schools. Yeah, and I'm glad I followed Helen in that particular uh, situation. So our departments do collaborate pretty significantly in that area. Um, so I also encourage people who have these same questions in regards to out of school time, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, in terms of setting up a structure and a process, um, we have been reaching out to schools to identify what some of those needs are, um, particularly in this time and um, looking to assist schools in having access to partners. So um, we are working on that process. Um, so you can reach out to me. Mm -hmm. One more thing I wanted to add, I'm sorry, Molly, was we're actually releasing a survey to all of yeah. our community partners that we know are vendors to the district um, to actually ask them, uh, where have you been providing services? Are you able to provide services this fall? What do you need from us to be able to support you to provide services? So. Um, if you are not currently a CPS vendor um, or want to be, or maybe you haven't gotten or don't receive that email, please reach out to Jennifer, Molly, myself um, to make sure that we get your feedback um, and connect you to these services. I think one question that um, we have for schools is, and it may not, the answer may not exist yet, but I know for those of us who do work in schools, it, it's the question of how will we be able to engage in the fall? Um, just because of the realities of COVID. So I think being able to an get an answer to that will help us even be able to strategize as well. 
I can tell you we are absolutely working on that. So uh, we're putting out guidance, of course, for our school leaders um, on how to partner with agencies. And there will be a complimentary guidance for agencies on how to partner with schools. And so uh, as we figure out our, you know, hybrid learning um, and how we're going to, you know, get our students together and, and present, uh, we'll be doing the same for our partners. Great. Thank you. And I, I think I want, I want to add something to this that I, you know, when I think about the principalship as a former principal, the, the seat that principals hold to keeping the city of Chicago or any city together right now, I mean, they're not wearing capes um, as superheroes, but they are definitely at the intersection of, you know, making sure that students and families are well within cities. And right now, when you think of, I had a, I'm having a lot of thoughtful moments uh, in my life, reflecting on many things. But principals, when you think about, schools are the only place where hundreds of people come together for hundreds of days at a time to have hundreds of interactions. The only two places that are close are nursing homes and prisons. There aren't social institutions where you have such a massive interaction of people. And when you think about principals going from the strike to the global pandemic, to racial injustice, they are really keeping cities together. And they're managing their own sort of lot, their own pandemic response and emotional turmoil. I say all of that to say this. Um, it is important that organizations um, reach out to schools within their community and reach out to schools that have been historically underserved to not say, hey, how can I help? But to say, here are the services we offer might any of these be helpful to what you're trying to solve for within your buildings? And I think that offering of supports and, and letting principals and school leaders know what's available can go a very long way in solving for making sure young people get what they need to thrive in this pandemic and beyond. So I just wanna put that out there, like principals are really holding space more, I would say more than most people because they're, helping families to solve for many things. And so I just want to offer that to the group and to those who are listening. Yeah, I, I was going to jump in, but thank you for saying that. Um, the other piece I would say is why that's important is because um, sometimes the services that uh, partners may offer, we may not see that we need that right now. And then all of a sudden the next day a parent will call and you'll be like, oh, wait, how can I help you? Um, but I think basically right now, also I would add to what Maurice was saying is that Principals right now are getting bombarded with so many things from, um, let me show you how to build your, your uh, distant learning classrooms. Uh, let me sell you this for your floor. Let me sell, you know, so um, we're sifting through all of those things and still trying to find our parents and our students. Um, and so I think it's important that as we're doing that and keeping ourselves sane, if I could say that was some, some form of, of sanity that, um, I would say that if somebody came to me as a partner or one to join or one to see how they can help me, it would drive me crazier if I felt like they were trying to sell me something else. Um, so as, as Marie said, if, if, if partners right now say, hey, I see there's a need in Austin and we really want to be a part, here's what we can offer. Um, then let me then sift through that so I can figure out how to fit into what we need and not feel like now I got to do it because it's one more person telling me a, a, another thing to do. Um, I, I hope that helps with that though. Yeah, that just reminded me of the, uh, I'm sorry, just, I'm, I went back to look at the topic of this, this session and social emotional health and well being for Chicago's youth. But I think we sometimes forget the, the people who are on the front lines with the youth and what they need and what their social emotional needs. And as I said, you know, we've had sessions with teachers that we thought we were going to talk about one thing and it ended up just really being a space for them to vent and share, but you know, Maurice, you brought up teach principals and you know, district leaders, people who have been working nonstop. So I wonder, is there a second session, you know, just about how do we care for the caregivers to make sure that, you know, and, and I know just as, as a leader of an organization who has not been able to stop. Um, and think and reflect and like, how has this impacted me? I don't have time for that because I've got to think about how this impacts staff and students. So also just thinking about how can we better support the people who are on the front lines with students who we are asking more and more and more and more every day 
um, to be stronger and better and then their leaders and then their leaders. So that's just a plug you that just it tugged on my heart to hear you both um, say that. I wanted to chime in um, just to, to talk about something personal. My the principal at my daughter's school is Tamara Witzel. And she's, she's amazing. She's been around for a long time and the school is Tepo Chikali Elementary School. But within the school, we have a nonprofit embedded that serves the needs of the parents. And it's very effective at allowing Tamara to address certain aspects like uh, the, the educational aspects while another um, entity helps out with the family needs. And so during COVID, there was a huge push for, you know, diapers in the neighborhood. And this was all funneled through TSEP, which is the Tepo Chikali Education Project. It's, I don't know why there's not more of those, but it's pretty awesome. Thank you so much. And we have a, another question. Um, and this is for all the panelists. Um, how can we work together to bid, build visibility and collaboration with our communities of support, programs, organizations, departments, with being, we being community members, non-CPS, and community organizational staff? Can I jump in on that one? <laughs> so, um, um, great question. And the reason why I jumped in on it, because I think about the Austin community, um, how we've um, been really, really working hard um, in the Austin community where um, we're bringing people in and we're meeting. Um, now, of course, we're meeting virtually, but prior to this, we were meeting and bringing um, different organizations in to talk about what they, they do or can offer. And then we would pull them in to be a part. And so uh, we continue to grow. Um, and I think that's been a huge part of what we do um, that has really been helpful. Like we've even met where there's the faith base that meet with um, at the 15th district, but then we have partners that meet at the 15th district because then they say, how do we get the police involved in that? Um, and then from the school point, we go, um, they have principals where they're, they're meeting as well. And so I think the best way to get that out is to just start with a meeting and then start with everybody talking about what they're doing, which could turn into um, a table somewhere, which could turn into um, advertisement at a parent meeting um, or at the teacher PD. Um, I just think we don't get together enough to then talk about what we can offer and then tell people what we offer. We kind of just almost offer, 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 offer and never do it together. And so, um, when it gets principals, it hits this way. When it gets to parents, it hits this way. And it just feels like, once again, a um, people just throwing balls at you and you, you're trying to catch them all at the same time or juggle them all at the same time. So I would say start with meetings, uh, get a little coalition, a group together. Same thing we do with youth boys. How do we get the youth together to start talking about it? You start with a couple uh, youth to say, let's start this piece, grab another friend. Um, and then we start talking about our mission and how we get it out. Anyone else interested in jumping in? I was going to say, Jen, I mean, we have plans for some things we know we want to do this year. Um, we do offer trainings to our schools on how to partner with agencies, like how to find an agency, how to know who is a good fit for you. Um, and so we'll be doing more of those this year. So that's our way of also trying to, you know, raise your awareness of the services that agencies provide. Um, we'll also be creating a database. Um, and as much as we can collect from you is who is where doing what. So that principals um, and other school leaders that are looking for those um, organizations can find them easily, including a list of what other schools you're at. The most powerful um, really recommendation is word of mouth. Principals ask each other, you know, uh, and rely on their experience with agencies as they explore who to partner with. So we'll certainly be contributing in that way at least. Hi everyone. I hate to, to cut the conversation off. It's been great. I just want to be conscious of time. Um, Chief Jen, if you want to move us into the next section. Um, so now I, I would like to ask if anyone has any additional final thoughts on our panel. I, I just one thing for me, um, be nice. 
everybody's experiencing something to some degree. You may not get everything you need from a grocery store. You may not get the response you want from a school. Be nice, be kind, and understand that we are all in this together and that we can continue to do this work collaboratively. I would love, I know we haven't had time and I just filtered through some of the questions in the chat. Would love to find ways to, to get to some of those conversations, which a lot seem to be around integration. I also saw questions around tools and other ways that we can collaborate. So just wanting to, to figure out a commitment to continuing to have this conversation go on so that we can continue to connect with each other. Absolutely. Any other final thoughts from our panelists? Yeah, I just want to say thank you because there are a lot of participants in the audience who are very important partners of CPS and you have been very helpful to us in the last several months. So I just wanted to have the chance to say thank you. Yeah, I would like to ditto that. Um, and I wanted to say thank you for several reasons. Um, just being able to stand as a principal and always feel like hopefully I represent us well. Um, and statements that I said maybe hopefully resonate with everyone for our principals, um, but that you would know that principals are here because we want to do this work and we're called to this work. Um, although some days it doesn't feel like it or it can feel overwhelming, but know that um, this, is, this is what we dreamed of. I mean, we're literally recreating, re-eventing, reinventing so many things in life right now that will change our future. So. Uh, just, I just want to say thank you to all the principals as well and, and our leaders for being a part of this. Anyone else? Well, with that, I want to um, share some gratitude for all of you.